Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Communicating Across Culture series. My name is Amanda McKendry and I serve as the Arthur F. and Mary J. O'Neill Director of the Fanning Center for Business Communication at the Mendoza College of Business. I'm delighted to be here with each of you today to examine the communication skills critical to enhancing our cultural awareness, our knowledge, and our practical skills in an increasingly diverse workplace. Key sponsors for our series include the Mendoza College of Business, Notre Dame International, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. This programming would not be possible without each of these groups who have worked to bring this program from an idea to reality. Thank you for your support. Today's discussion is informed by a few pre-recorded videos that are posted on ThinkND, where Jim discussed a few critical concepts on intercultural communication. If you haven't had a chance to review them, you can access those recordings after today's discussion. Nearly 600 people have registered for today's session. Some of you may have registered to see clarity around a problem or challenge that you've experienced in your workplace or in your community. Others may have been inspired by the opportunities that emerge when we gain a deeper understanding of communication and culture. To discuss these concepts, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Professor Jim O'Rourke, Notre Dame class of 1968, and Linda Rutherford, Senior Vice President and Chief Communications Officer at Southwest Airlines. Welcome, Jim and Linda. For today's program, you can expect to hear a brief overview of Southwest Airlines, as well as what Linda is most proud of at Southwest and how she thinks about diversity and inclusion. As we explore this company's unique culture, we'll highlight significant changes over the years, organizational culture, and future directions. We'll then open the floor for Q&A. If you have any questions for Jim or Linda, please use the Google form that we are sharing with you now. This will allow us to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. And we will try and answer as many questions during today's session. Now let's turn the program over to my colleague, Jim O'Rourke, a master teacher and expert in corporate reputation. Thanks, Amanda. Very much appreciated. It's good to have all of you here today. Uh, wherever you may be, it is a little overcast and rainy in South Bend, but that makes us feel like it's finally autumn. The, the leaves are starting to turn, and I took a walk across campus yesterday, and I really got that old positive feeling that I used to have as an undergrad. Uh, this is a special place, and I think each of us, for those who haven't been back in a while, each of us on campus is making a special effort to create um, a real college experience for our undergrads in particular. So they're feeling like they're part of a community, even though everybody's wearing a mask and in some class classes, half of them are online, uh, others are in the room. Um, this is still a great place and I encourage you to visit from time to time. Now, those of you who were on uh, the previous two calls, with Chris Murphy um, and with Denise Carcos, know that this is broadly about culture and communication. Communication um, is, I think in my books, defined as the transfer of meaning. So if I understand you the way you understand yourself, then we've probably communicated. Culture, according to my colleague, uh, Gary Ferraro at the University of North Carolina, is all that people have, think, and do as members of their society. So that would include material objects, ideas, values, attitudes, and behavior. And we're gonna talk about all of that um, with a good friend today whom I've known for some years. Uh, welcome, Linda. Welcome to Think ND and Communicating Across Cultures. Linda Rutherford is uh, Senior Vice President and Global Chief Communication Officer at Southwest Airlines, uh, which used to be thought of as one of those other airlines. Now it's 
one of the legacy domestic air carriers. And we may talk a little bit about what comes with that sort of designation. Thanks for sharing your time and expertise. I appreciate it. Thanks, so, Jim. Linda, as we begin, I'm wondering if you might help me and our viewers online with a brief description of Southwest Airlines and uh, talk about that as both an enterprise and a place to work. What's the organization like these days? Well, uh, in a word, resilient. Uh, certainly the last seven months have been unprecedented and uh, particularly for travel and tourism, hospitality, uh, the airline business, it's been unlike anything um, certainly that I've experienced in my 28 years here at Southwest Airlines. But uh, even uh, checking uh, with my colleagues who've been here far longer than I have, uh, just really unprecedented in, in the company's history. Um, today we have uh, about 750 Boeing 737s. Uh, we serve, uh, at the end of 2019, we served about 101 uh, different communities, including uh, near international uh, service in Mexico and the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, we've got about 60,000 employees and um, we right now, obviously our footprint is a little bit different. We do have some airplanes that are parked and idle. Uh, we do have reduced capacity, uh, obviously because of reduced demand. So uh, I would say uh, resilient and coping with the current environment. Uh, tell me where those seven threes are parked. Are they out in Arizona, Davis Mothin, or are they at Love Field? So it, it depends on the airplane. Uh, as you know, we, we own 34 Boeing 737 MAX airplanes, which we were flying and then we could no longer fly. Um, March uh, 2021 will be two years for that, by the way. Uh, those are parked uh, either in Victorville, California, uh, or at one of the Boeing fields up um, in Washington. And uh, the rest of them are parked where we have available parking at some at our maintenance facilities uh, throughout the country. So, um, as I recalled in the Air Force, when we would pickle an aircraft, um, it would go into a kind of hibernation and it would take us a while to bring it back online. How long would it take to bring those airplanes up if, um, if a vaccine's available and demand surges? Well, we, we've been doing a mixture of what we call short-term storage and long-term storage. And so uh, there, there are differing requirements basically to unpickle, uh, as you put it, those airplanes. So some we can literally bring up in a matter of 24 hours uh, and some may take several days. And so what we're constantly trying to do is keep the fleet fresh. So if we're gonna park an airplane, it isn't like we're parking one airplane for a period of two months. We may be parking the equivalent of one airplane if that makes sense, but then rotating them through uh, our fleet in order to keep, you know, Boeing 737s like it best when they're flying. And so that is the mission uh, is to keep as many of them, you know, in, in some sort of rotation as we can. But just generally speaking, the fleet is, um, you know, in April, we sat hundreds of airplanes down and we've recovered a little bit from there. Uh, what we still have under about 100 airplanes uh, that, that are not actively part of the flight schedule uh, today. Yeah, airplanes are always happier when they're in the air. Uh, I think flight deck crews and FAs are always happier as well. Um, so as I think about the last couple of days, um, the 30th of September um, was expiration of what you call the PSP, payroll right. support plan. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, Southwest, I think, and perhaps one other, it may have been Delta, said, that they're committed to not furloughing people, but I think there's a difference with Southwest. You're committed to the end of the year for not furloughs? That's right. After, uh, after the original CARES Act passed in March, uh, we were able to get a share of the payroll support program that was earmarked for the airline uh, industry. And it's been helpful uh, to replace our payroll costs every month you know, those can run in the in the $700 million range per month. And so uh, this certainly helped um, cover some of those uh, costs. The commitment uh, that all airlines had to make by accepting those funds were that they would not furlough 
uh, until October 1st. So we're, we're here, we're beyond that. Um, but, but we did make the commitment uh, based on some voluntary separation programs and extended time off programs that we were able to offer our employees, coupled with cutting all essential spending, we've been able to manage uh, some of those losses, perhaps a little bit better than our competitors. And we did make the additional commitment that we would not lay off or furlough through the end of the year, uh, even with the expiration uh, of the PSP this week. Now, that's not sustainable for the long term, so we certainly have to think about what comes next. Okay, so talk to me about your own team in communication. Um, can you give me some sense of how big it was um, six or eight months ago and how big it is now, and whether or not you've restructured any of that, reassigned responsibilities, perhaps let go of a few initiatives and projects? What's life like in your corner? Um, I actually have two departments. One is called Culture and Engagement, and it's really focused on um, employee data and insights, uh, culture events and activities, recognition programs, and uh, that team uh, was about 66 people. Uh, they lost 13, and then I have a communication and outreach group, which is really all communication, social business, uh, and all of our uh, preparedness functions around uh, enterprise risk management, business continuity, emergency response, all those good things. That team was about 126 or so, and, uh, and that team lost uh, 15. So we definitely, uh, both the leaders of those groups have definitely gone through a restructure uh, since that happened uh, in, at the end of July. And uh, yeah, they've done a great job of just going through and focusing, because you obviously, you can't keep doing the same level of work with that few uh, with, with the numbers going down on your teams because you'll just wear people out. So we did an exercise where we basically looked at every single thing we do uh, to support the company and we put those in priority order and the things that were at the bottom of the list, we either decided to pause, uh, we discussed and debated whether we could do them differently, i.e. more efficiently with fewer people, or if we decided it was just simply time to let go of that. Um, and so I've been very proud, obviously, of, of the group's ability to focus and decide that there are things that we just, we, we're not going to be able to do anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we'll certainly hope, hope to have a time to, to reassess that when the organization, you know, recovers and is fully stable uh, beyond the pandemic. But for right now, the, the, the ability to focus has been um, a great thing to watch. Well, tell me a little bit about that culture and engagement group. I don't think there are a lot of organizations in the Fortune 500, the S&P 500, that have an outfit with that particular designation. What do they do and how did you decide that that was a good use of the company's resources? One thing that has always differentiated Southwest has been the iconic corporate culture. So, you know, it starts with um, a, a huge emphasis on hiring and recruiting uh, a, a certain kind of, of person to come into the organization, and then really um, the investment to keep them highly engaged. At other companies, they might fall within a learning and development organization. Some other companies, they might be part of an HR function. Um, Long time ago, our, pre our then president, Colleen Barrett, decided that it needed to report directly to her for a couple of reasons. She didn't want it to get bogged down into a functional view or a functional priority. She wanted it to be seen by the company and by the employees as one of the top priorities and therefore wanted it to report directly to her. Um, over time, uh, it is it is picked up responsibilities, but it's it's charged with the understanding the employee experience, meaning what does it mean when you think you want to come to work here uh, throughout the moments that matter in your career all the way to, you know, when you're opting to either um, leave Southwest or retire. And they uh, help the organization understand from every employee's perspective, what are those moments that matter? And then how is the organization addressing those moments that matter? Are, are we good at it? Is there a gap? Um, they have an entire insights function where we are regularly polling, focus groups, survey employees so that we have an understanding of that level of engagement. And then there's an entire effort around recognition and awards and um, you know, a way to help employees kind of build equity and affinity with the organization. Okay. I mentioned in a conversation with you a little while back that Southwest is a company that is now considered one of the big six, the uh, domestic legacy air carriers. Um, 
you know, I think Herb Kelleher might wince at that. Um, he, he always thought of Southwest as a kind of scrappy go get them startup. Um, so two parts to the question. One, is there anything in the company today that Herb or Colleen um, uh, or others would still recognize? Um, and how do you hang on to that startup mentality? Or do you? So I think Herb would do more than wins. He might throw a whiskey glass at you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I, I would say that uh, if you looked into the organization today, what Herb and, and Colleen and some of our original employees would still see is um, a manic focus on bringing the right kind of people into the organization. So those people who are focused on having a servant's heart, a warrior spirit, but a fun loving attitude, uh, a camaraderie, an ability to collaborate, um, an ability to take your work seriously, but not take yourself too seriously. I think that what Herb would especially see today is something that he termed back in the 1990s. He used to say that when uh, other airlines would zig, we would zag. And he called that having the alacrity of a puma. And mm -hmm. that organizationally, uh, our folks are able to pivot very quickly to adapt to a dynamic industry. And he would look into that organization, into this organization today and say, that alacrity of a Puma is still there. If you look at Southwest Airlines in February of 2020 and where we are today, the pivots that we've had to make to the operation, um, how we're organized, uh, what we're focused on, I, I think he'd be cheering us on from heaven and say that, that an alacrity of a Puma is still very much alive. Well, for a long time, uh, Southwest was identified pretty closely with the charismatic and occasionally unpredictable um, Herb Kelleher. I know people in Atlanta and uh, elsewhere who were saying to themselves, what is he up to, right? <laughs> uh, I know he enjoyed that. So talk to me, if you could, about the transition from a founder CEO uh, or a management team uh, that now looks more like United, American, Delta, and the, and the others. How did, first of all, how did you manage that and what advice would you give to others? You know, Herb said for many years, I, I used to be a newspaper reporter at the Dallas Times Herald, which was one of the other major metro papers back in the day when, you know, big cities had two newspapers. And I remember asking him that question in 1990 and said, Herb, when you, when you get beyond 15,000 employees, um, how, how are you gonna keep this up? You're not gonna be able to go see every employee and hug every employee and kiss every employee and make sure that there's that level of engagement. And I remember him telling me then that th the organization wasn't about him uh, and that it shouldn't be about him. And so I think what he did from the time that he became uh, chairman and president was build an organization that has a depth of management and a and a longevity of management that would uh, be able to carry on well after him and it was really about surround yourself with great talent um, be agile in your thinking and he would uh you know sure he he appreciated his uh, wild turkey uh and he uh started some great traditions here uh many of which our leaders have carried on um for instance halloween is probably one of the biggest holidays of the entire year for southwest and while herb uh was known for dressing up um you know our current ceo gary kelly has been everything from dorothy from the wizard of oz <laughs> uh to jack sparrow and so you know there there is an expectation that um, we carry on that spirit that Herb and Colleen and some of our, you know, original employees started. And I think the, you know, we're a very strong organism. And if someone didn't sign up for that, I think the organism might reject them. So, um, you know, I, I think from a communication standpoint, the biggest thing that I had to do was show that connectedness, right, from, from the, the values that Herb had to the values that Gary has, mm -hmm. and about how they've been very consistent. And yes, today we might have 60,000 employees instead of 16,000, but the, but the cornerstones of our culture are still very much alive, even though things like airplane paint jobs and uniforms have changed. 
Well, I recall Ginger Hartage telling me that she put on seminars in which she would explain to people from alien organizations outside the airline industry and others yeah. how you do it. Do you still do that sort of stuff? We do, actually. It's called Culture Connection, and it sells out. So we typically do three or four a year. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, we've had to move those to a, a virtual environment, but we just did one, in, as a matter of fact, yesterday uh, and had sold it out. And so the, the Zoom room was full, uh, and you were still able to get a, a good dose of sort of how we do culture here at Southwest Airlines, and several leaders uh, had keynotes and, and were open for a Q&A panel. Uh, we did a virtual tour of all of our campus uh, so that you could kind of see uh, how the culture um, comes alive here at the organization, even though obviously right now it's a little quiet because we've got a lot of people working from home. Well, let's, let's drill in a little bit on culture. So two-part question, what are you most proud of at Southwest and what has to change? It's a great question. I think, I think what I'm most proud of is, is the continuing commitment and high engagement from our workforce. Because if you think about, you know, it's, a, it's an uncertain environment. Uh, certainly we're an industry in distress. Um, uh, tensions among the flying public are high and, and our employees, you know, uh, they're, are very much a face of the brand. And so how do you sort of meet those people where they are and make them feel comfortable about the flying experience? And so, uh, you know, they've been incredibly uh, focused on, on staying, um, on staying true to the Southwest brand, even in this um, new way of working. Um, so I would say I'm most proud of the high engagement. What has to change? Uh, knowing that we will come back, we'll, we'll be structured a little bit differently. Obviously we'll be a, a small, we'll have a smaller workforce. Um, we're really gonna have to think about how best to put our aircraft assets to use. So we're making some different decisions, you know, around uh, flight schedules and network. Um, and I think what will have to change is even new ways of working. So all of these buildings that normally have 9,000 people in them here in Dallas, Texas, aren't going to have that in the future. So we're going to have to adapt to new ways of working. Uh, and we're going to have to adapt the culture, which is really, you know, a culture of what we call hugs and handshakes. So uh, how, do you, how do you adapt that in the world that we're going to live in um, after the pandemic is over? And so we're getting creative about how we can continue to celebrate what, what, what and how we're different, even if we can't do it the way we used to do it. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, people. Uh, the conversation around culture these days increasingly centers on what people are calling DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, <clears throat> and what I would say uh, in my engagement with undergrads in particular um, in the classroom is that they have acknowledged how grateful uh, they are to George Floyd for giving us permission to talk about this, for giving us um, vocabulary, and for raising people beyond what was clearly a level of discomfort, and out it comes now into, um, so far for us, polite, respectful, thoughtful discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So at Southwest, how do you, do, do you measure those things? Do you manage those things? How do you encourage discussion? And that's a, a great question, Jim. So, so I think we had an awakening as well uh, in June that um, the efforts that we had been undertaking uh, were fine, but they weren't, nothing we needed to apologize for, but they weren't creating some of the real change that we wanted to see within the organization. So an example is um, diversity at leadership. Uh, ranks, as an example. So I, I was actually most appreciative that our VP of diversity and inclusion, along with our EVP mm -hmm. of corporate services, and I were able to have a, a very productive conversation with our CEO. And, and he said, we have got to put a stake in the ground and we have got to make material 
uh, progress against some of these goals that, you know, up until now might have been vanity goals. And so I was really pleased uh, just within the last week, um, we put out some very aggressive uh, commitments around how we're going to require diverse slate of candidates for leadership positions, uh, how we're going to require uh, diverse interview panels, um, about how you're going to be required to post those roles rather than just shoulder tap. So some real sea change in our processes for how we think about uh, identifying talent for senior leadership roles, uh, increasing um, diversity among our board of directors, you know, as a publicly traded company. Uh, but I think one of the most exciting things is uh, Gary Kelly kind of let loose our leaders inside the organization and said, your charge is to create safe spaces for productive conversations. And so hearing, you know, our DNI folks have been out doing road shows, but hearing all those conversations um, that are happening have been um, really gratifying, just that people are, are asking the awkward question, <laughs> um, that they are Im admitting things around unconscious bias, that they're being vulnerable, and we're actually able to have, as you put it, very respectful and, and deep conversations. And, you know, de several departments uh, have decided to make these standing meetings and standing conversations so that this isn't sort of a one and done, uh, but a real commitment to keeping the conversation going, which, you know, as you said at the very top of our conversation, uh, communication happens when when we understand one another, not when we're just talking at one another. And I think this is one of those very important exercises that, that you know, we're on the journey. I, I promised my old mentor, Don Fabin, who was a vice president for public relations at Alcoa in the 1960s. He gave me that definition. Communication is the transfer of meaning. And he said, Jim, I like it because it's focused on the receiver but I also like it because I can remember it. And I thought that was good. I said, can I use that? He said, it's all yours. I said, well, when I use it, I will credit you. So. Uh, no, I love that. Th thanks, Don. Um, so let's, let, let's talk continually now for a few minutes, if we can, about people. When you seek to bring people in or to promote them out of that first level to second level, um, are you looking for a particular set of qualities or characteristics? Are you more behavior focused? Um, how do you recognize potential? Great question. Um, we, our recruiters spend an inordinate amount of time uh, finding what we like to say that that good chemistry uh, with the organization because you know you can open a job and get 200 resumes and you know 60 of those resumes will be well qualified people uh, so on paper certainly able to do the job so when they actually get into an interview setting and they go through different interview panels uh, for particular roles um, and I'm speaking now of kind of an external candidate coming into the organization, we focus a lot on, on sort of um, teasing out that ability um, to work as a team, uh, examples of collaborative work, uh, examples of altruism, uh, examples of uh, having a sense of humor in the workplace. Um, and so, you know, able to get results. So we look for, uh, we tease out how you've been able to influence beyond your positional authority in previous roles. So we spend a lot of time getting at sort of what makes you tick, how you work as a team, um, how you view team and talent. And, uh, and that really gets us, I think, a good, um, that gets us, you know, most of the time to a really good result about finding that right person for that right role. Um, a hiring mistake is so painful because um, it just lingers. You know, the harm doesn't go away when you open the door and show them the, the, the opportunities elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> you have, I presume, a um, uh, performance review system and you sit down and talk with these people, is that mostly in the hands of frontline supervisors or does that kind of migrate up the chain? Do folks two, three clicks up the chain look at how the performance metrics are beneath them? 
Yeah, as an operationally driven company, uh, we have a huge matrixed effort around performance metrics. And so uh, it isn't a conversation that just happens at the front line. Um, yes, those conversations do take place between the frontline employee and the frontline supervisor, but then all of that information is aggregated uh, by location, as an example. Um, and the performance metrics can be operationally, you know, did planes push on time? Uh, were there any mishandled bags? Um, the customers, uh, we poll 10,000 customers a day. And so net promoter score, we can get at a location specific score to know how a particular team is performing. So there, there are metrics that go all the way up to the CEO's office uh, who can literally look at, you know, a dashboard very quickly and see, hey, we have a problem on the Philadelphia ramp. <laughs> Let's go figure out what's going on there. And so there is uh, broad awareness of that and broad accountability um, to be able to pick at those problems and go address them. For the folks in Philadelphia, this is a hypothetical <laughs> conversation. Totally hypothetical. Yeah. So let's talk about business. What's it going to take for Southwest to return to profitability? I think Ed Bastian said, um, and I, I didn't know what he was talking about at the moment I heard this. Um, he said, we're at about 20 right now, and we need to get back to 60 by the end of January. I thought he was talking load factors, but I think he's really just talking about takeoffs. I think he's just talking about scheduled flights. So he said there are about 20% of, of 2019, which is the last year he can compare. Um, Ed, by the way, as you know, is the chief at uh, Delta Airlines. Mm -hmm. And he said, we need to get to 60 in order to start breaking even. Do you have comparable goals or are you leaving this a bit soft to see what demand is like? Well, what we, we've had to do a lot, right? So the, the drop off in travel demand uh, March, April was breathtaking. Um, it literally went from, you know, load factors in the uh, 70s and 80s to airplanes that had one or two passengers on them. Uh, and so there's some pretty remarkable stories in April of, you know, a crew of three or four flight attendants, a pilot, um, a, a captain and a first officer, and maybe one passenger in the back. Uh, so that was, that was pretty dramatic. Um, the, the way that we're looking at it is uh, it, when we look at year over year, so if you look at 2019 as a good benchmark of business, right now um, our capacity is down. Uh, our load factors, so the percent of seats that are filled on an airplane is down year over year. Um, we have taken our flight schedule and reduced it to help meet demand. Um, so we've got airplanes that are parked, we've got some employees who are idle, and, uh, and, and we've been trying to tweak each month um, based on what we were predicting uh, might be the demand. So uh, when, when there are uh, signs that people want to get out and about, we saw some uh, green shoots in July as people were kind of finally got some, um, you know, fatigue and wanted to go places and it was summer and there was some summer travel, but then we began to see some hot spots right around the country. Uh, and then that demand fell right off again. Um, now you've got a lot of uh, college students who are learning virtually, so they didn't necessarily have to travel back to a college campus. So there's been, um, there hasn't been that dramatic drop off of travel that you might see in August when everybody goes back to school, we're still seeing some activity there. Um, you know, our business we've said is, is down about 65 to 70% um, off of what would be, uh, you know, normal um, revenues. And so the way we're sort of capturing uh, business recovery is, is in revenues. And obviously revenue is driven by how you can manage your capacity and then how you can um, try to create demand. So we've been doing a lot of stimulation with low fares. Uh, we've got a companion pass offer out there. Uh, we've really been pushing the, the elements of our Southwest promise. So it's, you know, mask requirements, uh, enhanced cleanings between aircraft turns, um, electrostatic uh, antimicrobial treatments on the airplanes during overnights, um, you know, physical distancing. So right now we're guaranteeing the open middle seat through November 30th, uh, as an example. Um, that should be permanent, of, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, Jim, it's not profitable. I mean, it, it could be permanent, but we wouldn't be here uh, next year, probably, um, because it's just you have yeah. to have the airplane filled more than 66% in order to be profitable. So, you know, we will have to, American and United have already done this, but move back to uh, filling the middle seats 
So we're, we're hoping, we're working right now with scientists, um, Harvard Medical, uh, and some others to look at how we can keep uh, virus transmission uh, as low as it is right now. There, there aren't a lot of instances of virus transmission um, from airplane flights. And so we want to keep you that upgraded way. your filtration systems. So we, um, we've always had HEPA air filtration, which is very similar to what is in hospitals and, and hospital operating rooms. And um, we uh, continue to look, uh, so we have, we're very comfortable with our HEPA filtration because not only does it circulate the air every few minutes, but it takes uh, virus particles out of the air and captures them in the filters. So what we want to do now is make sure that we have the best HEPA filter uh, that's available in the world. And so we've got our engineers, you know, looking at that. Same thing with the chemicals. So the, chem the cleaning chemicals that we're using, are they the best in the world? Are they the most effective at both disinfection and and, um, and, and then the antimicrobial coatings to prevent virus transmission. So it, it will take all of that to get us back to profitability. So we need to get all of our airplanes flying again. We need to see load factors improve. We need travel demand to increase. And the way our CEO has put it is that we need our business to double and then triple uh, from where it is today. So um, I know others have talked to me about their big customers and uh, Delta, uh, American, United, depend uh, on a certain small number of clients like, let's say, McKinsey or Ernst & Young or, you know, these folks who are in their mid to late 20s, they get on an airplane Monday morning and they go somewhere and they get on an airplane Friday afternoon and they come back um, and travel is just part of their lives their lives changed pretty dramatically. Do, how do you track that? Do you, are you in contact with those kinds of customers? Absolutely. So, you know, our customer segment obviously is split into both the business traveler and the leisure traveler. Uh, right now, business travel is little to none um, because uh, two things. One is that there are travel restrictions still in place in some states where you have to quarantine or you have to have a negative COVID test. So businesses have just, you know, put a put a stop to business travel. And then secondly, um, a lot of companies are doing what we're doing. They're curtailing all discretionary spending. And so the travel budgets are gone for businesses. So we've seen a, a very, you know, a steep drop off in business travel demand. That's going to take a long time to come back. It, you know, we believe that leisure travel, once there's an available vaccine, we'll begin to see uh, that increase. Um, you know, on a, on a fairly regular trend line, but the return of business travel is going to take a lot longer. And we, our corporate business uh, practice, we've got a number of sales folks out there. They're having uh, regular meetings like this, uh, where they're educating corporate travel managers on how we're managing our business in this pandemic, the things that we're doing to keep aircraft clean and people uh, safe and comfortable. Um, uh, but yeah, the Deloitte's of the world, the McKinsey's of the world, uh, Exxon Mobil, all of our big business travel clients are saying that, you know, right now they don't have the travel budget um, and that they, you know, they're looking ahead to 21, but we feel like that's probably even going to be into the back half of 2021 before we begin to see uh, some regular, again, uh, trend lines going in the right direction as it relates to business travel. Okay. Well, it's about 20 minutes before the hour, so maybe an opportunity, Amanda, to have a look at questions from our online viewers. Um, do we have anything in the question queue? Amanda? So I'm not, okay, there you are. Yes, there I am. I was waiting <laughs> for the unmute signal. We do have some great questions. Let's start with a question from one of our participants who recently retired from Southwest Airlines. So congratulations, Mary. And she, in her question, talked about how it's difficult to imagine the headquarters building being so empty, and how does maintaining the Southwest culture change when everyone is working at home instead of in the office? That, that's a great question. Uh, we've had to pivot very quickly uh, because there is a lot of camaraderie that happens in our physical space. So, you know, we don't call our break rooms break rooms. We call them culture centers. And when you go up and down the hall, there's a lot of eye contact, hugs, uh, and high fives. And so when you don't have uh, that physical closeness, you know, how do you, how do you keep up with people and, and keep that, um, 
that camaraderie and that care for each other. So we've, we've had to pivot to a lot of digital, uh, online, uh, remote. So I think what we're doing is we're celebrating. I mean, this, this, we're an organization that really did not do a lot of remote working prior to the pandemic. And so one of the things that uh, we had to do within a span of three weeks was launch, my, launch and educate Microsoft Teams um, and permit other platforms like Zoom uh, into our information uh, security uh, platform approvals. Uh, we handed out about 3,500 laptops uh, in the span of three weeks. And so the first thing we wanted to do was make sure people could be successful and productive working from home. We let them come up here and take their mouse or their, uh, their ergonomic chair uh, to their back to their home so that they could again work safely and productively and then our culture and engagement team really got to work and came up with clever ideas around uh, online recognition around um, trivia that the trivia rooms that could be created for people to kind of come into um, how to construct a virtual happy hour uh, what does recognition need to look like from a leader to an employee when you can't just walk up to their desk and tell them that they've done a good job so what does it need to look like in a digital and remote environment. So we've been trying to put a lot of tips and tools and creative ideas into the hands of our leaders to begin to um, be able to talk to our teams and our employees uh, about. So um, it, it's certainly much more quiet at headquarters, um, and that's for headquarters specific. Over at TOPS and over at our WINGS building, which is a lot of our frontline uh, training, that training is ongoing. So while everyone is you know, physically distanced and wearing a mask, there's a lot of activity happening over in those buildings. So at least our employees are getting to see and be with one another as they go through the training regimens. Well, as a fellow who teaches uh, management communication, let me ask, are your tips and ideas and new approaches considered proprietary? Is this inside <laughs> stuff or do you share that? Um, you know, we, we our, uh, our managing director of culture and engagement has done a few of these types of um, gatherings and I could certainly check with her. I know that she has shared some of those ideas uh, and materials in the past. There's certainly no pride of authorship. I think we're all uh, you know, asking everybody we can to share and compare notes and take best practices and try to, you know, turn them back into their, you know, our respective organizations, you know, as, as opportunities. So, um, I, you know, beg, borrow, and steal, uh, and, and we've done a little bit of all that. Good, good. So, Amanda, do we have other questions from our online viewers? Yes, Linda, this question focuses on your earlier comment about building safe and productive conversations. How have you created an environment of trust so that people have been willing to speak up candidly in those conversations and discussions? So the first thing we did was work with uh, a company. We'd actually done this a couple of years ago, but we were able to really amplify it uh, this summer with all of the conversations that were taking place. But we worked with a, a, a British uh, consultancy called Mind Gym, so G-Y-M. They were able to help us put together a five or six part curriculum that we like to call being fearlessly authentic. And um, each of those curriculum are, are mandatory for leaders uh, to first go through and have an understanding of um, creating conversations of, of what building an inclusive environment uh, entails of recognizing, understanding uh, microaggressions um, of how to be an upstander, not a bystander. And so uh, with all of that, they've been able to then go uh, and, and start to create environments where conversations can happen productively. So they set the expectation. Um, they have been able to share some of this learning that has been available to them through the leader learning portal. And, um, you know, everyone's doing it a little bit differently, but with the same core tenets that uh, an inclusive environment means that we respect diversity of thought and that everyone has an equal opportunity to be heard um, and that everyone has the equal responsibility to listen. Um, uh, an example is a, a fellow department has created a program that they call um, Heart of the Matter. And so they've been able to convene conversations and say, let's get to the heart of the matter. And so they've got a couple of moderators who are you know, setting the ground rules for how the conversation can be respectful and civil, but then inviting people to be vulnerable or ask that awkward question. Um, got another, another department that is doing uh, what they're calling um, uh, conversation 
social topics. Uh, so they're, you know, they're convening regular conversations where they're inviting a different moderator uh, every time they meet to sort of bring forward, it could be a piece of learning. Somebody's listened to a podcast, read a book, and using that as a way to sort of, you know, um, jump off onto a topic and conversation. So um, it, it really, I would say, is rooted in what we call in DNI team value and respect. So it's respecting that that we are a team, we will work together. Uh, it's valuing what each person brings and it's respecting the differences. Um, let me ask you a diversity question to follow on that. Some of the academic findings have shown that as organizations become more diverse, less homogenous, that some decision-making slows down that it takes longer to get to a point of agreement. But they also seem to have found that there was a higher level of commitment to the outcome, that once everybody had had their opportunity to speak up and weigh in, that the, the new decision moved pretty quickly. Would that um, uh, sort of underscore your findings uh, or have you noticed any of uh, any changes regarding the information gathering decision making process at Southwest? Well, so I would say culturally we're different. Uh, so we're a highly collaborative organization, which I would think, um, again, in my 28 years here, has always led to a very thorough. Uh, uh, journey toward a decision. So, um, you know, when you, we, we leave no stone unturned. So on one hand, you've got Herb Kelleher saying, you know, have the alacrity of a puma. Um, and then you have this highly collaborative culture that wants everyone to have an opportunity to weigh in, feel like they own a decision, feel like they've had input. So, you know, it's communicate for buy-in, that kind of thing. Um, in this environment, I would say Southwest has gotten better at uh, a speed of decision making. Uh, so we've been able to kind of knock out some of the organizational bureaucracy that might be there while still allowing people to have an opportunity to weigh in. And so that's culturally already who we are. And so it'll be interesting, again, as we get more diversity at those leadership levels, um, I'm, I would actually think it might help us speed up um, our decision making only because we we automatically culturally go in search of diverse opinions to make sure that we've thought of everything before we make a decision. If those people are sitting at the table to begin with, it might actually help us move faster. Yeah. General Eisenhower once said, if I'm about to make a decision and everyone at the table agrees with me, I will table that decision for a while. So uh, good insight there. Amanda, uh, other questions? Yes, we have one question here that uh, is asking Linda to talk a bit more about some of the statistics um, within Southwest related to how many employees are persons of color, how many employees are women, and then also what are your statistics for employees at the two highest administrative levels? And then lastly, what are your goals for the future in these areas and how did you set them at those levels? Sure. Um, I don't have all of those statistics right in front of me. What I will tell you is that we have matched them um, at every level against the S&P 500 and then against uh, the United States uh, general population demographics. At, at the front line, so if you think of it as a flight attendant or a ticket counter agent or a freight agent or ramp agent uh, or a call center representative, um, up through supervisor and manager, we mirror or in some cases uh, outperform um, the different demographics uh, that are demonstrated in the S&P 500 as well as in the U.S. population. And that's for uh, Asian Pacific Islander, uh, Hispanic, Latin, Latinx, um, and, um, and people of color, African American. So, so we feel really good about that. So we, we look like the communities that we serve. Where you begin to see uh, less diversity is when you move from that operational leadership into what I would call executive leadership. So uh, managing director, vice president, senior vice president. Um, and we, uh, what we have to do as an organization is, is make a better bridge for how you take a, a station leader in a particular city like Atlanta and make sure that that person is groomed and ready to actually take a support position in a headquarters function and be able to um, create more of a diverse pipeline in that way. Um, so we, uh, 
I don't remember the exact statistics. Um, you could, you can obviously, you could pull up swamedia.com and see, you know, from managing director and up, which is what we consider our senior management committee. I think we're roughly 30-ish percent um, people of color um, and, and we wanna do better. Um, and then when you look at our board of directors, uh, right now we have three women um, and two people of color. Uh, so what we have said is that we want to increase our diversity um, among our board of directors by 2025, and we've said that we want to increase both our um, ethnic and gender diversity among senior leadership. We want to double that by 2025, and so um, you know that that that's how we set our metrics. I think that would get us uh, closer to representing what's in the S&P uh, 500 in terms of diversity at senior leadership levels. Okay. Amanda, anybody else queued up with a question? Yes, we have one more question. And this question is, what changes that Southwest has implemented during this pandemic time period will remain in place going forward despite of the costs involved? Great question. Um, so costs involved. So right now, um, obviously, like every other organization, we had to pivot very quickly to make an enormous investment in PPE, personal protection equipment. So uh, I would expect that we will continue to make that investment so that masks are available uh, for our employees to be able to wear at all times. And then we always keep a supply of masks um, in the airports for if a customer shows up and does not have the mask covering because it's a requirement or something's happened to theirs, it's broken. Um, and so I, I would think that we will continue to make those investments. So it's sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizer stations, uh, masks, face coverings. Um, and, and I believe we'll continue to do that. Um, we will, uh, no matter the cost, probably continue uh, some very aggressive fare pricing in order to stimulate traffic demand. Um, there's obviously a, a cost that comes with that because while you might get the volume on in the airplane, you'll be doing that at a lower yield. And so we know that there's some trade-offs that we have to make there in order to continue to increase uh, travel demand. Um, those are probably some of the, the key things. The other things that we've done are, you know, we've, we've uh, extended the, um, the use time of our travel vouchers. Uh, we have extended um, use time of, it, of our rapid rewards uh, points in our frequent flyer program, meaning that your status wouldn't expire. So there's obviously a cost associated with all of that but we wanna to lean toward the customer there because you haven't been able to travel this year like you wanted to. So we didn't want to penalize um, our frequent flyer um, program members in that way. So those obviously an expense to that as well. Good. Um, you know, Linda, I think uh, from my perspective as an academic, <clears throat> if I look at the Notre Dame I've known for the last 50 years, one of the things we would say is, well, we don't do remote learning. We don't do MOOCs. We're not an online school. This is not the University of Phoenix. You got to be in class, right? Um, we've rethought a little of that. I run a lecture series in the spring of each year. I've done this for 20 years now called 10 Years Hence, in which we engage in a little structured speculation about the next 10 years. And in spring of 2021, we're going to be looking at uh, news, fake news, disinformation, how do we know what's true? Uh, a current important topic. Well, having identified the speakers I want, um, I sent out eight invitations and they all came back and said, count me in. Uh, I'm, I'm all over this. They knew they would not have to get on an airplane and fly to South Bend in January or February, you know, which takes, I know people find this hard to believe, it takes a certain measure of courage um, even if I tell them the Morrison has high thread count sheets and all that. Heavy <laughs> um, blankets, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, but I think uh, at least in the near term, uh, we may continue some of our practices around remote learning because we can bring in people from other continents, other time zones, people from uh, other areas of expertise. I talked to a fellow early in the week from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gotten him out of Arlington, Virginia to come to South Bend and kill two days of his schedule. Uh, but he said, you know, 
an hour and 20 minutes of my schedule is fine. I'm happy to give that to you. He's got some huge responsibilities on his desk. So I think we've learned from the, the lockdown. We've learned from teaching partly in class, partly online. And, um, you know, going forward, I think we're going to be a slightly different, slightly better organization. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to be just a slightly different, slightly better society, <laughs> honestly. And I, and I think that the next normal will be a hybrid, uh, certainly, of, of how we can use tools like this uh, to connect with people and have conversations. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're humans. And there is a level of physical connection that we must make. And so we will get back to that at some point. And, and that's just also important because, you know, the purpose of Southwest Airlines is to connect people to what's important in their lives. And so we want to be part of that journey. And, and, and we're anxious for people to realize that there's really no, no alternative to being there. Well, I know your suppliers um, and vendors feel that way. I know the folks at the Boeing company feel that way. Um, it's still, despite problems, best airplanes in the world. So Amanda, are we, uh, are we out of questions? Uh, we, well, we are at time for today. So let's just take a moment to thank Linda for joining us today and giving us an insider's perspective on culture at Southwest Airlines. And especially thanks to our participants for joining us today. We will meet again in two weeks for our final part, our part four of the program. The recordings are available for you and Jim's explainer videos are available for you at ThinkND. You can review those and feel free to join us in two weeks, prepared to discuss. Our guest will be Deborah Charlesworth, class of 1990, and she is VP of Corporate Communications at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.